Thanks for joining us here at VC2 where we are real people meeting real needs with the reality of Christ. If you ever have any questions or you'd like to learn more about us as a church, you can always check us out online by simply going to live.vc2online.com. Or we'd love for you to stay even more connected throughout your week and everywhere you go with the VC2 app. You can download it wherever you get your apps from. Today we're starting a new series entitled PG, Parental Guidance Needed. During this three-part series, we'll be discussing the need and practicalities of parenting the generations to come and how each generation must be involved together for us to see revival sustained. In this first message, we heard from guest speaker Reggie Joyner, founder and CEO of Rethink Group and previous executive director of family ministry at North Point Community Church in Alpharetta, Georgia. You can find out more about Reggie, including books he's authored at thinkorange.com. Now, here is week one of our series, PG. I've known our guest speaker um, uh, vicariously for, for years. I read books about him. I knew that I had a relative that was kin to him, but I'd never met him. And I'd actually been praying for some time and, and asking God if he would make a way. Uh, I appreciate this man and his heart for the next generation. I appreciate his heart for, for the lost. I appreciate his heart for small towns. I appreciate what God has done in him and is doing through him. And I asked God to connect us, and it just never happened. I, I, I tried to tug on strings that were close to him. And then one day out of the blue, I just out of the blue, someone called me and said, how would you like to meet with Reggie Joyner? And I'm like, is this a cruel joke? I've been trying to meet Reggie Joyner most of my life. And uh, they said, well, well, he wants to meet with you. Uh, or he's wanting to meet with some of the people that are causing stuff to happen in Washington County. And I said, name the date and place. And, uh, and I, I want you to know over the last, it's been a little over a year that we've gotten to know him. Um, I'm, I'm both blessed and humbled by what God has done in his life and his heartbeat for Central Georgia. You see, guys, we have been telling you we're going to reach Central Georgia. But we understand it's not just about what we're doing, but about who God is connecting us with, bringing the pieces together, because it's going to take a net work, a net that works to bring in the harvest. Amen. And so I'm honored to introduce you today, part of the network that God is building and our friend Reggie Joyner. Reggie, would you come and share? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. And let me just say a couple of things. Um, and I know you, you're probably aware of this. I know you're aware that you have a unique church, a unique pastor, unique leaders in this place. Um, I get to travel, meet a lot of pastors in a lot of cities and a lot of towns. And um, when God brought Chad and Melinda back here, he was doing something very amazing in this community. And, he, and I, I just want you to know that. I just want you to know that because I get to be around a lot of guys and a lot of ladies. And, and, um, and God is going to do some unique things here in this church. And, and I'll say this too. The secret of this church is Melinda. <laughs> now, and the reason, the reason I know that is because anytime I'm around her, and I hear her passion for the next generation and for kids and what's in her heart to do, yeah. I just believe that um, God is preparing you for some, some incredible things. Amen. And uh, my, my story is pretty simple. Um, you know, my mom grew up in Johnson County. My dad grew up in Johnson County. And uh, I spent most of my summers and most of my Christmases here as a kid growing up. And about two years ago, my mom passed away. As a matter of fact, the last three years have just been a roller coaster for me. We've had three weddings. We're getting ready to have our fourth wedding. My mom died in the middle of all that. And so it's just like, you know, crazy, crazy time. And um, about two years ago, when I was at, you know, my mom's funeral, it dawned on, on me that my mom and dad had been married for 53 years and that my dad was going to be spending his weekends here every other weekend alone for the first time in his life. And so I decided, well, you know what, I'm going to hang out with dad for a season to make sure he's okay. Amen. And um, so I would come here on Saturdays and hang out with him in the shack that I refuse to sleep in that's in the middle of the woods. And um, <clears throat> I got a hotel in Dublin while he slept in the shack, but I hung out with him. And, um, and it just so happened that, you know, during the course of these few weeks, I thought, you know, what I do is I partner with churches. I work with churches. I help churches around the country. And so I, I'm going to visit the churches in Johnson County. I, you know, my goal was, you know, I'm going to visit every church in Johnson County and see what's happening until I realized there were 77 churches in Johnson County. <laughs> 
So then I just started asking questions. I started saying, well, you know, to some of the leaders in the town, you know, what are the churches I should go to? Where, where should I spend my time to understand the pulse beat of what is happening and where I can do work and what I can do? And so I started hanging around some of the leaders in Wrightsville. I went to First Christian Church, First Methodist, and I went to Brown Memorial. I went to CNBC, an African-American church, and to, over to uh, Thompson Grove Church, where there's a leader there named Hayward Cordy, who's a great pastor that I admire. He was the first black superintendent of Wrightsville. And so I started meeting with these leaders to find out from them what, what are the issues and, and what are the things that we can do to help. And I remember one in my office, by the way, was the Dairy Queen in Wrightsville for a year and a half. So most of you know how that is. And so I remember sitting in Dairy Queen with one of the pastors one day and after talking with him for a year, and he said, he said, what I would love for you to do is write down everything that we've talked about so that I could give it to my elders and my deacons and some of my leaders. And uh, I remember thinking, well, I've already got books. He said, no, I don't want any of those books. He said, they're too long. He said, I want you to write, that, write a book <laughs> that is really fast. And so literally, I wrote the shortest book I've ever written in my life called A New Kind of Leader. And it, it really took me my whole life to write it. But it was really, really short so that I could hand these leaders and these people in town uh, just some tools. And, and, and so my heart, this is interesting, and I don't, I don't mean to say this to state the obvious, but for me, my heart has really changed in the last year and a half, meeting Chad and Melinda and meeting some of the leaders there. It's hard to explain. You know, I, I care about things now that I didn't care about two years ago. I care about the time that Dairy Queen closes. You know? I, I, care, I, I care about, you know, who gets selected to be on the Board of Education. I, I care about, you know, who just went to the hospital and what lead pastor is struggling because some congregation or some members are taking shots at him. I mean, I care in a way that I haven't cared before. And, and here's one thing that I've learned. And it just reminded me. It was kind of going back to your roots and just kind of remembering I, I, re I remembered something that somewhere along the line, I think we forget, and that's this, that a church doesn't thrive because of what they believe. And, and the reason I say that is because it's not your belief that makes this church grow or thrive. Come on. You know how I know that? Because I attend churches that are dying and they believe the same gospel you believe. They believe in the same Jesus you believe. They believe in the same Bible you believe. Yeah, a church doesn't thrive or grow because of what they believe. They thrive or they grow when they do something about what they believe. Come on. And so what I want to do today is just lean into you and tell you about one thing that in the book I wrote that I, I wanted to kind of emphasize in every church. And the reason I want to talk to you about it is not because you don't get this, but because I know you get this. And because I honestly believe that you are uniquely positioned in this community and in these counties to be a light and to be a model for this. But maybe sometimes we forget we forget and get distracted about what really matters. And we just need somebody to come along and go, oh, don't, don't forget. Don't forget that this is a piece of your DNA. This is a piece of who you are that you cannot abandon. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason I know and I believe it's easy for you to get distracted and it's easy for me to get distracted is because the disciples got distracted. Yeah, there was one day that they were so um, kind of self-absorbed and feeling pretty good about themselves. They had this attitude issue, you know, related to their egos, and they did something that caught Jesus' attention, and so for him to confront it, he did an unusual thing. They had just dismissed some children as if they weren't important, as if they didn't matter, and Jesus said, no, 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 wait a second. He called one of the children to them, put a child in front of him. He said, no, here's, here's what I want you to understand. And then he said something so profound that sometimes I think we miss the essence of this. He put a child in front of them, and here's what he said. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Now, don't miss this. It's as if Jesus were saying that day, how you treat a child is a reflection of how you treat me. That if you, if you don't want to miss God, and I know this is true, if you don't want to miss God, then you need to pay a unique kind of attention to the children that are around you. He took that child and he elevated that position in a very, very important way. And it was as if Jesus were saying that day, you need to start acting and believing that every kid matters. Not, not just the kids in your house, but the kids in your neighbor's house. 
Not, not just the kids who go to this church, okay? But the kids who live around this church and in this community neighborhood. Somewhere along the way, we've got to understand that we have this important critical responsibility when it comes to the next generation and what we're called to do. And the question today isn't, do you believe kids matter? The question is, do you act like kids matter? Now, now again, if, if I had my preference, I would be sitting with you at Dairy Queen across the table and we'd be having a conversation. Because I'm an introvert. I don't even like a lot of people. I mean, I, I like to be with a few people at a time. So (laughs) the problem in the New Testament was not that the disciples did not believe that Jesus mattered, but in that moment in time, they were not acting like they believed that kids mattered. So somewhere along the way, we've got to decide that kids matter. And this is a personal question we have to ask. It's a practical question we have to ask as a church, as an organization, you know, and I know as an organization, you believe kids matter because it's written all over the DNA of this church. But one of the things I'm going to have to say to you as leaders and as individuals is, but is that practice in this church something that is showing up in your personal life with the children you meet and the children you interact with? And when people stand up here and they say, we need people to show up in the lives of kids and the lives of teenagers, are you the first to show up? Because somewhere along the way, we're not going to reach and change the next generation until this becomes a personal conviction that moves us individually to action. Yeah, come on. So... I'm going to give you a few suggestions, a few reasons why this is important, so that if you ever find yourself in a situation on an airplane and someone asks you, oh, do you think kids matter? You can say, here's some reasons I think kids matter. Or if you're ever sitting around in a meeting in your church and you just need to remember why this is important, you can lean into each other and say, no, let's not forget, kids matter and here's why they matter. And if anyone's ever asking you why is this idea of building a legacy center so important, you can, you can lean into each other and you can say, no, no, here's why it's so important because kids matter. Now, don't miss this. What you do for kids matters more than you think it does. The reason I say that is because we don't always see the immediate results of what we do in the lives of kids, do we? I mean, any of you work with preschool in the room? Any of you work with preschoolers at all? We got a few in here. Any of you have preschoolers in the room? Okay. Got a few. You don't have a preschooler who you love and you show affection say to you, thank you so much for teaching me about Jesus today. No. How how many of you you have middle schoolers at all? Some of you have middle schoolers. Okay. You work with middle schoolers. Some of you work with middle schoolers. Okay. When's the last time you had a sixth grade boy say to you, I just want to thank you for what you said today so much because now I'm going to be a better dad because of what you said? Now, when are you going to have that happen? No, no, no. There are no immediate results in this. So you can't see it, but that doesn't mean you should not continue to do what you're supposed to do in the life and the heart because you're planting a seed that one day will show a different kind of harvest. I'm going to say something here that could be a little contradictory. You can throw this one away if you don't want to believe it, but I'm going to suggest it. That what you do for kids matters more than anything else you do. I I, I wanted to say it this way, but I didn't want to offend anybody. I wanted to say what you do for kids matters more than what you do for adults. You say, now, wait a second. Are you putting more value on the life of a child than the life of an adult? No, I'm just saying there's a window of time that when you focus in on a life, the changes that are happening, the bags that are being packed, the stuff that they're carrying with them will carry them into adulthood. And the sooner you start in someone's life, the greater the return will be later on. This is just since You can ask any educator. Any educators in the room? Raise your hand. Teachers, educators. You would know. Right here. Back over. You would know that what you're doing in the life of a kid in this window of time happens, uh, makes more, more sense, matters more than anything else you do. Yeah. And then I would say this. What your church does for kids will keep your church from dying. One of the things that I have to deal with in my work is the stats and the research of what is happening around the country. And there's a graying factor that's happening in the church. Most denominations, most mainstream denominations now are saying that the average age of the attenders in their churches are approaching 60 to 65 years of age. And in the next decade, a lot of these denominations will simply lose half of their attendance simply because of the fact that there's a graying issue in the church. And we're having people get older in the church, but we're not reaching people that are younger in the church. 
And you know what else the research shows? This is kind of an interesting thing. The research shows that every church thinks about their resources and their facilities and their budgets like a pie. And that there's this tension that happens in every church. I mean, it's just, it's just, it just happens. That if I take more of this piece of pie and I give it to this age group, then that means this age group over here or this ministry over here gets less of the pie. I mean, that, that makes sense because you have a limited amount in the pie. But here's what the research is showing. That if you take more of the pie and you give it to kids and to teenagers, the pie gets bigger. Somewhere along the way, we've got to understand and start acting like reaching the next generation is building the future church. And the reason I know this is because I went to my granddaddy's church when I first started this, this journey of mine two years ago. And I sat in the church where I used to do revivals when I was in my 20s, and there'd be 200 people who would show up. And I counted 18 people in the congregation, seven in the choir, and I was the youngest person in the room. Now, I wasn't that. But the point is, the point is, we can stop this. If we decide that we're going to prioritize the next generation and what your church does for kids and tell me this isn't true, what your church does for kids will keep your Sundays more interesting, right? (laughs) Can you imagine what a church is like when there are no children and no teenagers present? There's a church in Scranton, Pennsylvania that I love to talk about um, because the church had been reduced. It's a little white church that sits in this town. It's like a Norman Rockwell painting. And this church has sat there for 150, 200 years. And the congregation was reduced down to about 12 elders. They were all over 60. And, um, and these elders realized that they weren't growing, they weren't moving. And they looked around. This is an interesting thing. They looked around and they found a church that was dynamic enough, that was reaching kids and teenagers, that, were, that was out of room in their student ministry. And they gifted their church to the student ministry. And this other church was reaching kids. And I got to show up the Sunday, the first Sunday when they were opening this, this building, reopening this building for kids and teenagers. And I remember walking through the basement where they had repainted all the walls. And there was a 70-year-old lady standing there who was one of the elders. And she was crying. And I'm thinking, oh, she's mad because they painted it the wrong color. They changed the carpet. What is this going to be about? And I said, are you okay? And she said, I just never thought I would hear children laughing in this building again. What you do, what you do and what your church does for children, children will keep Sundays more interesting. And here's something else. And this is what I absolutely believe as well. What your church does for kids will make adults better Christians. Amen. So you really, I'm going to say a couple of things here and this, this could get me in trouble, but I, just stay with me. Here's what changes you as an adult investing in someone else. As a matter of fact, we had two rules at North Point. We started North Point with Andy Stanley 15 years ago. We had two rules. One is we're not going to recruit anybody until we have all the leaders we need for kids and teenagers. And the second is we're going to tell everyone who's been there for more than two years, if you're not serving, we can't help you grow anymore. So somewhere along the way, somewhere along the way, you've got to understand that after two years, Chad's told you everything he knows. Okay, somewhere, somewhere along the way, you've got to decide this isn't about sitting and soaking and learning more information. This is about getting involved. And if you want to change the temperature of this church, you take some of your adults and you put them in rooms with kids and teenagers and let them start discipling the next generation because it will change your adults more than it will ever change them. And then what your church does for kids will change how they see the church. I mean, I promise you, somewhere along the way, you have to recognize that what you're doing here is changing the way a generation sees, perceives, and views the church. And and I'll go a little further with that one. What you do for kids and teenagers will change how they see God. What would happen if we just started acting like Mm. the best chance a child outside these walls has to see and know who God is, is to put an adult in their life who acts like God. There's there's a guy in 
New York. His name is Jeffrey Canada. Jeffrey Canada was an education reformer. And Jeffrey Canada was a black man who grew up in Harlem. And there's actually been a documentary done about Jeffrey Canada called Waiting for Superman. Because Jeffrey Canada believed as a kid growing up in Harlem that one day Superman was going to come and rescue him. He says the saddest day of his life is when he recognized and realized Superman wasn't real. <laughs> Somehow he managed to get through the streets of Harlem, get to Harvard, got his doctorate, and he decided to come back to New York, back to Harlem to reform education in New York. And I was interviewing him a few years ago, and I asked him, I said, if you could say anything you wanted to say to the church, what would you say to the church? What would you say to church leaders? about their role in helping kids in public schools and their role in helping kids in, in communities. He said, I would try to make sure that every, every Christian adult understood something, that the reason their kids in Harlem who do not believe in God is because they've never been around adults who are God-like. And more specifically, they've never been around adults who will show them what it's like to be forgiven and start over. And the church has the best opportunity to lean into a generation who doesn't know how to restart and to say to them, you can be forgiven. Amen. Somewhere along the way, somewhere along the way, we've got to start acting like kids matter. And it takes all of us to act like kids matter. When you walked in today, they gave you a white card. And, um, and the reason I gave you this white card is because I want you to use it for something specific today. I want you to write down a name for me. And before I say this, I just want to speak to those of you who are 60 and above. And the reason I want to speak to you that are that age is because I'm getting close to that age. And I just want to say this in all love and kindness. That there's a tendency we have as we get older to think that we've paid our dues. That we've done our time, which sounds like we were in prison. <laughs> But I want you to know that the idea of a legacy center and the idea of being a legacy and the idea of living a legacy doesn't happen until you're gone. Yes. And that some of your sweetest, most productive, most powerful years and moments in your life, I think, can be 60s and 70s. I gave a man who was 80 years old an award last year in front of 8,000 leaders because he led middle schoolers for 40 years. And because of the impact he made in their lives. And they lined up, generations lined up to say, he got us through the most difficult years of our life. And here's the question. And here's what I want you to write down on your card. If you wrote down the name of someone who showed up for you, mom, dad, leader. If you were to write down the name of one person who showed up for you, maybe two or three, maybe it's a short list. What would those names be? Because what I want you to do today when you walk out of here is I want you to remember that there were some people who showed up in your life who made the difference in your life as a kid or as a teenager or as a young adult. And by looking at those names, you're simply saying, you're right, there are people who showed up for me who were significant in my life who basically built a bridge between me and where I needed to be. And if you were to ask me today to write down, to write down a name, I would write down the name Geneva Bray. Some of you may have heard of Geneva Bray. Um, Geneva Bray was born in 1893, and she died in 1992. Um, she lived 99 years. And she actually was a Sunday school teacher in a little white church out on Highway 57 called Bethel Methodist Church. And as a kid growing up, I would sit and I would listen to her teach Sunday school um, through the summer months, through the Christmas months. And there was a painting that she had painted that sat behind the pulpit. It sat behind the pulpit. She was a painter. She painted this picture of Jesus knocking on the door. You ever seen a picture like that? You know, Jesus knocking on the door. It's like Jesus is in his ancient garb. And for some reason, he's standing at a door in France and knocking on the door. How he got there, I don't know. <laughs> but she painted this picture. And, and I would sit in church and look at this picture and listen to Aunt, Aunt, Aunt Nene Geneva Bray teach and, and speak and I would kind of you know learn from her and there's all these all these kinds of facts that I found out about Geneva uh, the fact that she lived most of her life without indoor plumbing um, the fact that um, she once tied a duck to a table to paint its picture um, <laughs> it's a good thing Peter wasn't around then um, the, the fact the fact that um, 
she, she never married because of a broken heart. She went to college for two years and her dad pulled her out of college because his brother convinced him he was wasting his money educating a girl. The fact that she never drove a car. Um, the fact that she lived through two world wars, Vietnam, the invention of the Apple computer, and 23 presidents. Um, and somewhere in her 50s, she decided to hitch a ride with a friend back to a local town to finish her education. And she became a school teacher for 40, 40 to 45 years. And if you were to ask anybody in Wrightsville, Georgia, if they know Geneva Bray, they'll say, yeah, because she taught me in the first grade or the fourth grade or the fifth grade. No, there's, there's no way to even imagine how many people that she impacted. I couldn't name all the names of the people, but I can tell you about one. She was a girl who was born to an unwed mother outside of town off of New Buckeye Road. An African-American family took her, kept her for a few months, and then the doctor who delivered her decided to adopt her. And when she was eight years old, the doctor took his own life. When she was nine years old, her adoptive mom took her own life. So they took this girl back to the house where the family lived because even though she wasn't family, they were her only hope of having somebody to take care of her. And um, they asked around. Most of the families had too many kids and money was tight. They were getting ready to take her out of the house to put her in foster care. When Geneva Bray said, nobody has asked me, I'll take her. And as a 54-year-old who'd never had a child, who'd never drove a car, she became the guardian and the custodian When you're old, you can't control things. Like when you get emotional, <laughs> when you pass gas. I mean, it's just. <laughs> it just happens. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So the reason I know is because that little girl was my mom. Wow. And Geneva Bray had no idea. She had no idea. When she built an extra bedroom under her house, when she cooked her a steady diet of cream corn and fried chicken, <laughs> when she intimidated the boys who wanted to date her, when she pushed her to make good grades, when she paid for a college, when she paid for a wedding, she had no idea. That it would have a ripple effect. On her faith. This is my mom. And this is my brother's kids and my kids, my dad. You can tell we had a lot of girls in our family. <laughs> I used to tell my son, you know, you're just in boot camp for marriage. That's what you are. <laughs> and here's a picture of my two brand new two grandkids. Granddaughter on the left that was born to my son. Grandson on the on the on the your left, my right, that was born to my. And, and again, you can tell we have a lot of strong women in our family, right, with that picture. But <laughs> the point is, I would spend summers attending Bethel, and I would sit and I would look at that little picture sitting behind the pulpit. And the summer summer could be long and hot for a eight-year-old and a nine-year-old sitting in a church with no air conditioning. It was murder and a boring pastor. I mean, I'm just telling you, you'd be thankful you got Chad. But I would sit and I would just get kind of lost in that picture. 
You know, because you know how you kid, you imagine. And I'm thinking, how did Jesus get to France? I mean, I would be thinking, how did that happen? You know, in my mind, it was during the Star Trek days. I felt like a starship, you know, brought him. And I imagine Jesus saying, beam me up, Scotty. I mean, it was just all these things went in my head. And I remember saying to Aunt Nini one time, I don't think you finished the painting. And she said, why do you say that? I said, because you didn't put a doorknob on the picture. I mean, here's a picture that she painted. Because you didn't put a doorknob on the picture. It still hangs in Bethel Church on 57. I said, you didn't put a doorknob on the picture. And she said, no, 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 that's intentional. I said, why? She said, because Jesus doesn't force his way into anybody's life. You have to open the door from the inside. And I imagined in that moment when Aunt Nini, who became known to me as Aunt Nini Geneva Bray, imagine in that moment when she, when she first explained that painting to my mom as a nine-year-old whose father had killed himself, whose mother had killed herself, who was craving attention and affection for someone. Because here's what happened, and we know this in our family. When my mom threw open the door, when she found out Jesus was on the other side of the door and wanted to get in her life and somebody wanted her and to be involved in her life and to be a part of her life, we, the joke around our family is she threw the door so wide open and let Jesus in, she forgot to close it back. <laughs> Because my mom met no strangers. I mean, you can, ask, you can ask anybody. I mean, she would meet the waiter at the restaurant, and she would know his name and number. And I mean, she met no strangers. And if you, if, if you came to her house and you knocked on the door, she would complain and say, never knock, just come in. I mean, she wasn't careless. She had a Remington 1112 gauge shotgun sitting in the corner loaded. So, I mean, she wasn't like she was careless. <laughs> And a pistol under her pillow. I mean, it's like, <laughs> that's a different story. But, but, but she, just, she just had no boundaries. I mean, when it came to getting involved in people's lives, you can ask her daughter-in-laws. I mean, because she felt like you didn't have to knock to come in. She could go in their house anytime as well. So, I mean, there were, there were no boundaries. She was that mother. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, we got you. <laughs> <laughs> but if you could ask Geneva Bray... Was it worth it? Which I did one day. She said, was it worth it? What do you mean? I said, was it worth it as a 54-year-old spending a decade of your older years taking care of a kid? She said, it was never even an option. She said, it was never even consideration. Yes, it was worth it. Every once in a while... I meet that kid, and you can say they're not in this church and not in this town, but I guarantee you they are. And you can say that you're, you don't think this sometimes, but I bet you do. You know you meet that kid or that teenager, and you can't say this out loud or people think you're, you know, you're not a good Christian. You can't say it out loud, but you think in your mind, I'm not even sure Jesus can help this kid. And whenever I meet that kid, I think about my mom. Amy, you said to me that day, yeah, it was worth it. You got to understand something. When you open the door to Jesus, you open a door to whoever God loves. And there are people in this town, people in this community, people who will show up in this church, people outside this church. You may be their only chance, their best chance to see God's love personified. And God is going to bring some people into your life that may not be easy to love. But when you open a door to Jesus, you're opening a door to whoever God loves. You know what else? When you open a door to Jesus... You open a door to whatever God can do. Amen. You see, here's what I know. This is what I know. Because I've done this a long time. Some of you are sitting there going, well, I don't think I'm qualified to work with kids. I don't think I'm qualified to work with teenagers. I just don't think. Let me, let me show you a picture. This is a picture of Geneva Bray and my mom. When Geneva was 54 and my mom was 9. Now, let's just be honest. She's not the coolest looking cat you'd ever meet. <laughs> Which, by the way, gives me hope for a lot of you. Okay? So just stay with me for a second. 
God hasn't called you to be cool. God has called you to care. Come on. This is so important. And this isn't about what you can do. This is about what God wants to do through you. And you may get over what Chad may say to you from this platform one Sunday, but you will not get over what God can do through you in someone else's life. And last of all, you open a door to wherever God takes you. You open a door to wherever God takes you. I'm going to ask Josiah and the band to come back in place. But I kind of want to say something to you at the closing here. If someone had told me three years ago I would be spending every other weekend in Wrightsville, George, and Johnson County, I said, are you kidding me? Not that I, I love, I love Johnson County. I love what I grew up in, but I'm busy. But God had something else he wanted me to do for a season. You see, I don't know where God is going to take you. I don't know what God is going to do with you. I was riding around at 11 o'clock at night till 3 in the morning with the police chief in Wrightsville, Georgia, because he wanted to show me what Friday nights were like in Wrightsville between 11 o'clock and 3 in the morning. The first stop we made was a 14-year-old who'd already been in trouble twice, and he was unscrewing light bulbs in the funeral home so he could watch them crash. And I said to this cop, who I don't even know is a Christian, I said, what's the solution for the kids in this town? He says two things. They need something to do that matters. And they need somebody who cares in their life. I don't know how to say this without it sounding hard, but you've got to hear me here. If you've opened the door to Jesus, you don't have an option. You're called to be a part of something that's bigger than just you. And besides, someone opened a door for you one day. So there's a reason for you because someone showed up in your life, right? And if that isn't good enough, (laughs) Jesus showed up for you one day. And Jesus wants you and me to know that there's something he doesn't want us to miss. So he puts a kid in front of us. And he says, you want to see me? You want to know me? You want to experience me? Here's a way to experience me in a new way. I don't even know what the invitation is supposed to be today. Maybe you're here and you're saying, my problem, my life is nobody showed up for me. And I want to become someone who will show up for someone in a way that someone did not for me. Or maybe the calling in your life as a mom or dad is, you know what, to go back into your world with your kids and your teenagers and to say, it's time for us to be in a different kind of relationship. Because I don't want life to pass you by if we're not connected the way we need to be connected. Or maybe, maybe it's simple. You just need to be reminded today that you should show up for someone because someone showed up for you. And when you walk out the door today, you got to make a phone call or send a text to somebody who was significant in your life to remind them how important it is, remind you how important it is to show up. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for just your love for us, for this church, for the light they are in this community, for what you're going to do with these people, for what you're going to do with the vision of this leadership and this pastor. And God, I continue to pray that as a congregation and people that we will follow you in your calling to welcome a generation as we would welcome you. In Jesus' name.